Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this service. My name is Bob Lapine. I'm the pastor here at Redeemer Community Church. On behalf of Donnie and Melody and the family, uh, we want to welcome all of you to this service this morning. Uh, welcome to those of you who are joining us online as well. I know we've got folks who are watching on the website, a lot of people who couldn't be here but wanted to be a part of this day. Um, this is not a day that any of us were looking forward to. You know what? I'll switch to this. And... This is not a day that any of us were looking forward to. Um, well, in a sense, Bob was looking forward to this day. He was prepared for this day. Uh, two weeks ago, I was uh, in his living room, and we were visiting, and we talked about being ready for this day, and, and uh, he was at peace with whatever God had, and we didn't know that that conversation would be the last conversation this side of heaven, but we talked about everything from uh, Isaiah to Irving Berlin that, that day, talked about music, we talked about his love for the scriptures, we talked about uh, the events of his life, we talked about his sarcoma and about the treatment, and um, uh, I, I just said, we don't know what's ahead, but the fact that we know that you're ready for what's ahead is what matters the most. And the reason Bob was ready is that he had surrendered his life to Jesus many years ago. And he was looking forward to when he would be face-to-face -face with his Lord and with his Savior. So this morning, we want to spend time doing three things. The first thing we want to do is we want to honor and remember and celebrate what was a rich and full life, Bob's life. All of us were touched by him in many ways. He touched so many people through his music, uh, customers at the store, people who heard him. Uh, he touched many people through his involvement with AA over the years. And of course, his faith in Jesus made him a friend to everyone. His abundant kindness and generosity were, were things that were characteristic of him. In fact, if you've been on his Facebook page in the last week, you have seen tribute after tribute from people who have known Bob through the years and whose lives were marked and touched by his life. It's a life worthy of remembering and honoring, and so we're going to do that. I, I can't think about Bob without thinking about his smile. He did not just smile, he beamed, and the joy was radiant on his face. Um, I, I just want to read to you what was in the newspaper on Saturday, what's on the back of your bulletin as you arrived this morning, Bob's obituary. Uh, Bob Boyd, beloved husband, father, and friend, longtime musician and entrepreneur, died Thursday, October 8th, 2020, at the age of 84. Bob was born in Mayflower, Arkansas, May 26, 1936, to J.A. Boyd and Minnie Ledrick Boyd, Bob was a leader of his own band, most recently called the Bob Boyd Sounds, for over 50 years, in which he played piano, accordion, and tenor banjo for thousands of private engagements and concerts all over Arkansas and surrounding states. Bob married Donnie Jean in 1960, and together they established, owned, and operated Boyd Music Center, the music store that, and teaching studio from 1962 until 2000. Bob loved to encourage anyone who entered the store to try out any of the instruments that were of interest to them. Boyd Music remained a friendly gathering place for musicians of all ages and skill levels to hang out, to learn, and play music during its 38 years of operation. Bob later served as a sales consultant to Sigler Music Center, Little Rock Piano and Organ Company, and Little Rock Frets. He was always seeking to serve the musical community, Bob and Donnie also founded Boyd Pro Sound, a sound design company that installed state-of-the-art sound systems in churches and auditoriums all around the state. Bob was a longtime member and served as president of the Arkansas Grocers and Merchants Association, who awarded Boyd Music Center, Inc., the title Retailer of the Year, the only music company to ever receive that award. In 2015, Bob received the Legends of Arkansas uh, Living Legend Award in recognition for a lifetime of inspiring musicians 
In 2018, he was inducted into the Arkansas Jazz Hall of Fame. Bob was also a longtime member and served as a volunteer arbitrator and board chairman of the Better Business Bureau of Arkansas. He was a master Freemason for many years, was active in the National Federation of Independent Businesses, served as their delegate to their conferences in Washington, D.C. Bob became an avid runner in the late 70s. He ran countless road races through the years, including five marathons. He was passionate about many subjects, had an undying thirst for knowledge, had a wonderful sense of humor, and a notoriously dry wit that kept all around him laughing. His counsel and words of encouragement and wisdom were frequently sought by friends and family. Bob attended our church, Redeemer Community Church in Little Rock. He loved Christ. He loved to study the scriptures. He was a member and sometimes leader of several Bible study groups. He will be greatly missed by all of us, by friends, countless friends who he loved dearly. He's survived by his wife, Donnie Jean Huddleston, one daughter, Melody Lynn Arnestalt, and grandson, Cameron Boyd, both of Massachusetts, five nephews, four nieces, many cousins, a multitude of friends. And uh, we miss him. I'm going to say more about his life in just a minute. The second thing we want to do while we're here this morning is we want to Grieve. I don't know that we, we really want to grieve, but it's right for us to grieve. It is good for us to grieve and to mourn the lossing, loss of our friend. We need to know that God is near to those who are grieving, that he embraces those who grieve, and he wants to be a comfort to all who are in sorrow and sadness. He invites us to come to him this morning and allow him to to be our comfort and our source of peace when our heart hurts and when joy seems far away. The Bible says, for all who know and love Jesus, we grieve differently than other people grieve. We grieve, but not as those who have no hope. That's a great promise, a great comfort for us. To have no hope in this life is to have despair, but we have a hope in Jesus, that this life is not all there is, and one day we'll be with Jesus and with Bob again. So in hard seasons like this, in a season of grief, God invites us to find our comfort and our peace, and even to find joy in what the Bible teaches us about the reality of eternity. And I just want to read a couple of passages to you that tell us what is ahead for us, who, who know and love Christ, and what Bob has already embraced and won and experienced. In the oldest book in the Bible, in the book of Job, Job expressed his confidence that one day he would spend eternity with the God he loved. He said it this way. He said, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. It's a great promise of scripture. In Psalm 16, King David said this. He said, therefore, my heart is glad. My whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you, God, will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures evermore. What a wonderful promise. And David concludes, of course, the most famous psalm in the Bible, Psalm 23, by saying, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And Jesus, when his beloved friend Lazarus died, after he wept, he demonstrated power and authority over death, and he declared, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me when he dies and by the way, I'm, I'm reading this from Bob's paraphrase of the Gospel of John. Some of you know Bob, one of his passion projects was to paraphrase books of the Bible to write what he called the word on the street. When he got to John chapter 11, he had Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, when he dies, he's going to live again. Whoever lives and believes in me, he's not ever going to die. And then here's what Bob paraphrased from Romans 8, the last passage I'll read. He said, here's the list of things, the list of stuff I can, 
um, excuse me, here's my list of stuff that can't rip us loose from God's love. The love we get through Jesus Christ. Dying nor living, angels nor demons, good nor bad kings, high nor low places, things happening now or in the future, not a single thing in God's creation can break us loose from Jesus' love for us. So these passages point us to the third thing. We want to remember Bob's legacy. We want to celebrate his life. We want to grieve appropriately. But the third thing we want to do is what Bob would tell us to do if he was here directing this this morning. He would want us to spend time remembering and reflecting on the gospel, the good news, on Jesus. We're all here this morning to remember that our hope and our peace and our joy is in the promise that Jesus gave us that to be absent from the body is to be present with him. So we're going to spend some time meditating on that great good news this morning that life is not meaningless, it's not futile, it is not devoid of purpose. The grave does not have the last word. Death has been swallowed up in victory. This perishable body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. This is by God's design. So we're going to not only talk about the gospel this morning, we're going to sing about the gospel and find our joy and our peace and hope in the gospel. For those who, like Bob, have surrendered their lives to Jesus, this, there is a day ahead when, as I said, we'll see him again. But the good news is when we see him again, we will gather our voice with his and we will sing praise to our God. And that's what Bob's doing even now. So pray with me, if you will, please. Our gracious and merciful God, you have been pleased to take home the soul of your servant, Bob Boyd. Grant to us who are still alive and who walk by faith and not yet by sight. Grant that after we have served with you with consistency on earth, that we might be joined together with all of the saints who have gone before us, who are with you now in glory everlasting through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We want to sing together this morning. We're going to sing one of the hymns that Bob wanted us to sing at this service. That's Amazing Grace. And Bob wanted to make sure we sang verse 3 because he said that we often skipped past the verse that says, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already gone. And he said that needs to be sung. So we're going to sing all five verses of Amazing Grace for Bob. And uh, David Higginbotham is going to come and lead us in that. David, longtime friend and bandmate of Bob's. So, David, if you'll come up here and lead us in that sing, uh, in, in that song. Thank you. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind.
We had asked a couple of Bob's friends to uh, speak this morning, and the first one who's going to speak with uh, for uh, us today is Dr. Dwayne Velez, who was a friend of Bob's, a, a part of his small group. You should know that Bob was a part of a group of guys who got together regularly who called themselves the Geezers. That's the name they gave themselves as they studied the scriptures. And uh, Dwayne, if you'd come on up, we're going to ask Dwayne to speak. Uh, then we're going to hear a song that Bob wrote, actually wrote the lyrics for a, a song uh, that uh, David is going to come sing for us, and then we'll hear from Curtis Thomas this morning. So, Hello. I had the privilege of being a leader of one of the small groups here. We weren't so small. There were 20 of us, all of us over 50. And um, Donnie asked me to say something. I... Uh, I did not know Bob was a music legend. I just knew he was humble and kind and wise. He was one of the sages in our, church, in our group. Uh, sage is someone who's been through the fire of living on this earth and been refined like gold and is wise. And I have some things he said that I remember. A lot of things he said, we, well, often we laughed. When we thought about them, we just realized how profound they were often. Uh, and one thing he always did uh, he never called attention to himself. He's always calling attention to Jesus Christ. And it was obvious. Our group would meet, have a potluck meal, fellowship, talk, usually about the previous Sunday's lesson. Or, but sometimes we had a, a topic. One time it was finishing well. Bob did finish well. That's what I want to do also. Um, Sometimes in our discussion, one time we were talking about prayer, and he said, I'll never forget this. He said, Dwayne, when we pray, we'll always get what we prayed for or something better. I've tested that, and I can't see where it's not true. We may get weight. That's better. When we get something that's hard that refines us, that's better than what we prayed for. God knows. Another thing, one time, one time Bob, I said, uh, well, how do we get up each morning? This was part of the purpose of the small groups, to stir one another up to love and good works. That's why out of Hebrews. And we did that for each other, and Bob especially was good at that. How do we get up in the morning, Bob, and, uh, and be a good witness for Jesus Christ? He said, sit up, stand up, show up. Sp suit up, show up, speak up and then shut up. 
And you can see the wisdom there. I mean, we're told in the scriptures to uh, not be lazy, get up, sit up, stand up. I mean, we're told to uh, be bold, speak up. We're also told to uh, be slow to speak, quick to listen. There's a shut up. Uh, he, uh, I got this from Melody, his daughter. He uh, was asked, uh, you know, they just recently celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary. Uh, and they're going to get a plaque by a tree out front when you make it. I've got 14 years to go. <laughs> but he's, I think he helped me do that because uh, when he was asked, how, what's the secret of 60 years of marriage? And what he said, well, that's easy. Get married, stay married, don't divorce. <laughs> There's wisdom there. I mean, he's saying, keep your vows and, and uh, keep loving your wife or love your husband. Yeah, that's how he spurred me on. Um, he was humble. As I, I, I just want to be, uh, Bobby, Bonnie asked me to speak, but I want to read from the English Standard Version in James and then read you uh, his paraphrase in uh, the word on the street. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness, steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect, complete, and lacking in nothing. Here's his paraphrase. Brothers, when you find yourselves in a heap of trouble, it's time for you to jump for joy. You know that when your faith gets tested, you learn how to be patient and hang in there. No pain, no gain. Tests are opportunities for spiritual growth. They draw us closer to God. What else can we learn to become a spiritual grown-up? Isn't that good? Um, I'm going to miss Bob. I thank God for him. The song that David is going to come and sing for us, as I mentioned, is a lyric that Bob wrote. Uh, there is a traditional tune that has been used for everything from Irish folk songs to hymns. It's called Londonderry Air. Uh, you probably know it best as Danny Boy, the song that's familiar. Bob took that melody and wrote what he called Londonderry Prayer. And so David is going to come and sing that for us now. David. Father God, my kind and loving Creator, who walks with me through trials every day, you give me peace with storm clouds. dark you're with me all the way I thank you Lord for sending guardian angels when I am lost and cannot find my way dear Father day. 
Okay, I think Bob would want you to clap for Jeff and for David, don't you? That's great. Curtis Thomas, one of the geezers, going to come up here and speak on Bob's behalf. Many of Bob's friends uh, became acquainted with him through his music, but that's how I, how, not how I got to know Bob. Matter of fact, I'm as far away from musical talent as you can possibly be. And my wife often told me when I spoke elsewhere to make sure when the music's going on, turn your mic off. So, <laughs> but I got to know Bob in a different way. Uh, Many years ago, uh, many of us were members of the Bible Church of Little Rock, and uh, Donnie started coming to the Bible Church. As a matter of fact, she, she would often sit right next to my wife's mother, who's now deceased, and um, she wanted Bob to come, and, but she, did, she didn't hound him. She, um, she did what First Peter uh, the, the Apostle Peter tells her to do, that is, with a gentle and quiet spirit and with prayer. And eventually Bob started coming to the Bible church, and then later on he, uh, he came to be a member of Redeemer here, this church. And so I got to know Bob in a different way. I got to know him uh, as a member of the church and as a person who really was interested in the gospel. Um, we became friends in several ways. One, Bob was uh, very big on Bible study. And so he and I attended a number of Bible classes together. He also uh, was a member of, of uh, what we call the geezers, which is a group of us ancient fellows from many different churches get together at Homer's on uh, the first Thursday of each month. That is up until the time of the COVID crisis. And uh, we'd get together and have a breakfast and um, uh, talk over the scriptures and tell stories and, and find out how each other is doing. And um, occasionally we'd have dinner together with, uh, with, with our wives called the geezers. I also got to know him in, in a slightly different way. I was attending a small pastoral gathering up at Cabot, Arkansas once a month. And Bob said, I want to go. So he started attending with us and, and added an awful lot to that group. But one of the most important ways I got to know Bob was when he was writing his, uh, New Test his Bible translation uh, called The Word on the Street has already been mentioned. Bob would email me uh, things that he'd written and say, what do you think? Uh, do I need any correction? And so we would go back and forth through emails that way. And so I treasure my time uh, knowing uh, Bob Boyd. As I think of Bob, um, I, several words come to my mind, and I'd just like to mention those today. First of all, as many of you know, Bob was funny. When I think of Bob, I think of, of a funny person. He loved to tell a good story. And when it came time for that punchline, he would always break out in that great big smile. And so it was always a pleasure to, to be around Bob. And he had, through, his, through his 84 years, he had many stories to tell. And we, all of our groups enjoyed those stories and particularly watch him laugh after he got to the punchline. But Bob was also serious. He was serious about important issues. That is the Word of God, about spreading his testimony among those with whom he came in contact, and serious about his love for his family, for, for Donnie and Melody and, and the remainder part of his family. The third word that comes to my mind is grateful. Bob was not a complainer. Despite all the health issues he's had in recent years, Bob never complained. I never heard one ounce of complaint from him. He was grateful because he knew 
what was in ahead of him. But he also knew that he was in God's sovereign hands, and God was going to uh, deal with him as he should. He was going to deal with him in the very best way. And so Bob was always very grateful. Fourth word that comes to my mind is trust. Bob trusted in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ for his sins. He often mourned his sins, but he also trusted because Jesus Christ had lived and died for him personally that his sins were put as far away, as far away from him as the east is from the west. He also trusted God for the future. He knew that God had his life in his hands, and God knew the time, the best time, for him to be taken to heaven. And so Bob was, was a, uh, a man of trust. The fifth word that comes to my mind is amazing example. Bob was always ready to serve others. And many times I would uh, have to deal with people who had substance abuse problems, and I would call Bob. Bob, what do I do about this? And what do I do about that? And what do I say? And what should I do? And Bob would always say, you know, if you need any help, if he needs any help, just let me know. And Bob would often take those cases off of my hands and, and be a benefit to those folks. He not only was an amazing example in serving others in that way, but can you imagine a man in his middle 80s translating the scriptures? That's a, you may not realize, but that's a lot of tedious work, a lot of tedious work at, at, uh, at his computer and uh, stretching his mind. But he was doing a great job. He was putting the word like you speak out on the streets. Bob was a, good, a tremendous example to me personally by the way he used his gifts and his talents even while he was very sick. Bob worked on his translation almost right up to the date of his death. And so he was a tremendous example to me personally. There are many other words I could use about Bob, but I'd like to close with just this one word. Bob was joyful. Many folks with uh, health issues that he had over the last few years would be anxious or angry or, or depressed. But when you went to see Bob, Bob was always upbeat because he, know, he knew if the Lord took his life where he was going. He knew that all, every one of his sins had been paid for. And he knew that God knew what was best. God had his, had his uh, days numbered. And God was going to do what was right and what was best for Bob Boyd. I'd like to uh, just read in closing one last verse of Scripture that I think about with regard to Bob. Uh, this is from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Paul was in jail in Rome, not knowing whether he was going to uh, be killed or whether he was going to be allowed to live. And so Paul writes this to the church at Philippi. He says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in this body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ which is better by far. And if you translate that Greek phrase, the last phrase, better by far, you could le legitimately transfer, uh, translate it much rather better. And that's where Bob is. He's in a much rather better place. And I can just visualize Bob up there making the most beautiful music possible without any illness, without any disappointments, without any sin. He's making music that is pleasing the Lord and would be pleasing to all those that were there. And I think Bob would be saying right now, if he could talk to us, man, I wish you'd get up here. It is absolutely awesome. You can't imagine 
what it's like. That's how I remember Bob. Thank you, Curtis. Well, as we think about Bob, as we reflect on his life, uh, it, was, it was Wednesday, on a Wednesday, more than a dozen years ago, when I sat at a table at McAllister's Deli when it was still out on Cantrell. There was a group of guys that had gotten together that night for a it was supposed to be a study through a book on prayer, but as we got there that night, I looked at these guys, most of them who I knew by sight but had never met, and I thought, we just need to get to know one another a little better. And so I said, we're gonna, we'll talk about prayer a little bit, but we're going to spend some time just sharing our stories. I said, I'll go first. And so that night, I took about 30 minutes and shared my story, my background, my history, my, how, how I came to know Christ, uh, the ups and the downs. The next week, we had a second guy who I asked, I asked him to, to share, and I started asking him personal nosy questions, and he stopped and said, wait, are, we're going to do that? Like, we're going to be that honest with one another? I said, absolutely. Well, we got to the fourth week, and, and uh, it was Bob's turn to share, and before he shared, he said, you know, I, I have to tell you guys, when I first started coming here, I wondered if I would fit in with this group, but after what you guys have shared, your stories are worse than mine. <laughs> and I thought mine was pretty bad. He said, you may have uh, read what was in the paper on Saturday about Bob that listed out many of his accomplishments. His life was a highlight reel. Think of all he had the opportunity to experience the people. He had the opportunity to meet so many accomplishments. When we were together two weeks ago, we talked about when he met Johnny Cash at the Arkansas Hayride back in the 1950s. We talked about his time down in Pine Bluff at the club trio with the Browns when Jim Ed Brown and Maxine and they were getting started. We talked about some of the famous people he met when he played out at the Elotion the golfers who he got a chance to meet and shake hands with who had come through as the band was playing there. Um, Bob was, as all of you know, an impressive musician with an impressive resume. He was an impressive businessman. He was a runner that I don't think many of us here, I don't think any of us here, any of five marathoners here, maybe. Huh? He was an entrepreneur. But I, I want to read to you what Bob wrote about himself um, just, just a few years ago, here's what he wrote. He said, prior to my spiritual reawakening in 1978, my focus was on material things and self-gratification. When I was 15, he said, I had a spiritual experience and I had been sincere in my teens, but I became more and more indifferent to spiritual matters. After I graduated high school, he said, my principal values were earning money, building my business, playing music, and drinking. He said, my uncontrolled downward spiral into alcohol addiction produced more and more horrendous results and troubles in my life and consequently in the lives of others. He said, I was steadily and alarmingly doing things that were far removed from what I knew to be the right and godly way of living. In 1978, God mercifully gave me a moment of clarity and a new vision of myself and what he had originally intended for me. Bob said, I desperately needed the forgiveness of Christ as illustrated in the parable of the prodigal son. God showed me that Christ offers me a better life and that he died on the cross to give me hope of eternal life. Bob said, he is still my only hope of surviving spiritually and physically. He gave me the desire to go to any lengths necessary to recommit my life to him. He gave me the will to ask him to do for me what I could not do for myself, to free me from my addiction to alcohol and restore me to a right relationship with God and security in his presence forever. 
God said, he also revealed to me that I can do nothing to earn my place in heaven, that it's God's free gift to me if I believe and trust Jesus and his sacrifice for me. God did remove my desire for alcohol and for the lifestyle it offered. I was in awe of a God who could and would and did forgive me and heal my body and my soul despite the way I had mistreated my temple for those past 25 years. I asked God to change me and I became willing to do whatever he required. God moved me to recommit my life to Christ and to make him first and foremost in my life. What a testimony. There's a verse in the Bible in Ephesians 2.10 where the Bible says that each one of us, we are God's workmanship created in Christ for good works that God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. Bob's life was one where he took a few steps on that journey and then he wandered off. But in 1978, God brought him back to that path and Bob lived out the rest of his life walking in the path that God had prepared beforehand, that he would walk in it. That spiritual reawakening that he experienced is something that is not unique to Bob. It is something that God offers to any who will cry out to him. That spiritual reawakening redefined his life. It redirected and reprioritized his life. It took him from spiritual darkness to a place of spiritual light. And anyone who knew Bob before 1978 and then after 1978 saw the difference. They saw the transformation that Jesus had done in his life. Not just in his appearance. He, he did shed a few pounds. Running helped him do that, right? But it wasn't just his physical appearance. Not just the fact that he quit drinking. But people who knew Bob before and after saw a difference in what mattered to him. And they saw him move from being focused on himself to being focused on others, caring about others. That's when he began to walk again in the good path that God had set out for him. Some of you here today, some of you who are watching this on the live stream, some of you need a, a redirecting moment in your own life. Some of you have gotten off the path and again, if Bob was here, he would say, get back where you belong. Cry out to God. Confess your sin to him. If you've made a mess of your life in the same way Bob had made a mess of his life, if you have ignored God and his ways, if you have pursued your own agenda and your own priorities, Today is not just a day to gather and remember and reflect on the life of a friend and a loved one. Today can be a day of new life for you. A day when you move from spiritual death to spiritual life. All it takes is for you to do what Bob did back in 1978. He had that moment of clarity when he cried out to God. God gave him a new vision of himself and what he had intended for him. And maybe in this moment God is giving you or those of you online giving you a moment of clarity, a moment when you look at your life and say, this is not how I should be living. I want to be right with God. Maybe today is that day of new life for you. If you sense God is stirring in your heart right now, cry out to him, let go, surrender. Bob would tell you from where he is now that anything you're hanging on to today is not worth what God has prepared for you. Just like Curtis said, he would say, it's awesome here. Join me. But heaven is not the destination for all humans. Heaven is the destination for those who surrender their lives to Jesus as Lord and Savior. Bob's prayer for you would be that you would come to him, that you would receive him, that you would obey him, that you would walk with him. I've already read a few verses for you this morning from Bob's paraphrase uh, this was, like I said, a passion project for more than 10 years. Here is how Bob paraphrased maybe the most famous verse in the Bible, the passage in John 3 that leads up to John 3.16. Bob said, paraphrasing the scriptures, the only one who has gone up to heaven is the one who came down from heaven, namely the Son of Man, who has been there and can tell you about all that's there. 
Just like Moses raised up the bronze snake on a stick out in the desert, so must the Son of Man be raised up. Then everybody who believes in him will live forever. God so loved the world that he created so much that he gave his only human son that whoever believes in him will never die but live forever. So let me make that personal for you here today. God loves you so much that he gave his only son that if you believe in him, that you surrender your life to him, you'll never die, you'll live forever. And one day, together with Bob, you'll stand and sing praises to him. We're going to stand and sing now. David's going to come back up here and lead us as we sing about the blessed assurance that is ours when we surrender our lives to Jesus. So if you would, would you stand with us? And David, if you'll come up and lead us in this. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. Submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story. David. Be seated. I'm going to close our time together with a word of prayer. After we pray, we're going to uh, dismiss Donnie and Melody and the family. And we're set up in the, what we call the living room here at Redeemer, which is our, uh, our room over here to the left. You're welcome to come in and with your mask on, you can greet Donnie and, uh, and uh, say anything to her. And then the family will go to the graveside from there. So pray with me. Father, we thank you for the life of our friend Bob. Thank you for how we were blessed to know him, for how we saw your grace so evident in the way that you had transformed his life and how he lived for you as a result. 
the choices he made. Lord, it's hard for us to say thank you for taking him home because we miss him and will miss him in the days ahead. But we say thank you for his life today by faith. We thank, thank you for taking him home by faith. We say it because we believe that your ways are good and that all you do is good. And we trust you even when it's hard to do that. And Lord, as, as we've said, we thank you that we do not grieve as a people without a hope. Thank you that death is swallowed up in victory at the cross. Thank you that because you have conquered sin and death, the grave does not have a hold on all who belong to you. And Lord, again, we pray if there are any here today whose lives are not right with you, who need the hope that the gospel offers, I pray your Holy Spirit would press hard on them that they would not be able to rest until they make peace with you and bow to you as their king. For all here who do belong to you, Lord, we thank you that our hope and trust and confidence is in you, that you will never leave us or forsake us, that you are the God of all comfort. And we ask you now to comfort us as we grieve Remind us of the joy that waits for us, the joy that Bob is experiencing at this very minute. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll remain seated, we'll dismiss Donnie and Melody and then the family. We're going to go ahead and and run a short slideshow or a video that we've got that uh, will be here. If you want to wait here and watch this before you go and meet the family, you can do that. So go ahead and run that if you would.